as we continue our worship, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, come to us once more by the power of your word, by the movement of your spirit, by the gift of your grace. Remold us into your people that we may be sent forth into this world. Guide us now as we hear and respond to your scriptures. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the first reading was Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica, giving them encouragement during a time of trial, encouraging them to hold fast, to put on the fullness of faith, and to do what was right for the sake of the community. The second reading today is a reading from the Hebrew Scripture, from the book of Judges, and it puts those same ideas into a more personal and direct setting. As Pastor Heather mentioned, this is a story about one of the judges of the people of Israel, a woman named Deborah. Listen to God's word as it comes from Judges chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Haroshesh Hagoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Libodoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. The Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali. And Deborah said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take positions at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and from the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you at the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And Deborah said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 warriors went up behind him. And Deborah went up with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So friends, my sermon today is about Deborah, a prophet, judge, and military leader of old. You may not have heard much about Deborah before, but she's one of the judges who guided Israel in that in-between time before kings were named like David and Solomon. And in fact, as I mentioned, she's the only female judge named in the Bible. But at this point, it's good to pause for a second and ask ourselves a very simple question. If women comprise more than half of all the population in the world, why are there not more stories in the Bible about women? A quick survey of Scripture makes it clear that women are woefully underrepresented in Scripture. One of the reasons we hear about Deborah is because a song about her wisdom and military prowess is one of the oldest pieces of scripture that we have in the Hebrew oral tradition. Just like there's a similar short song about Miriam that was part of very, very old oral biblical material. So because of the songs of Deborah and the song of Miriam, they were so well known in ancient Israel's history that they had to be included in the Bible, despite perhaps the male author's biases that would downplay women of faith. But in truth, once you silence the voices of patriarchy and you let the women of Scripture speak for themselves, 
they add much to the story of faith. There's Eve, who is literally the mother of all humankind. There's Miriam and the midwives of Egypt who tricked Pharaoh, and because of their actions, the baby Moses survived. There are the women Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and others who faithfully bore the ancestors of all the tribes of Israel. There's Hannah, who was the mother blessed with a son who became the prophet Samuel. And in the New Testament, there's Elizabeth, who was blessed with the son John the Baptist. In the Bible, there's also Jesus' mother Mary. There's Jesus' own close friend and the first preacher of the gospel, Mary Magdalene. There's Lydia, a leader of one of the earliest churches brought together by Paul and many other. And see, by honoring these women, including Deborah, what that offers is an important corrective to the sins of the past that for too long kept women marginalized and in the shadow of the church. So let's start again. My sermon today is about Deborah. I, as a male pastor, will be speaking about Deborah, the female judge and prophet. At Eastleby Presbyterian Church, we are fortunate to be a multi-staff congregation. And we're fortunate for this church family to receive pastoral care and preaching wisdom from two exceptional women, Pastors Patrice and Pastor Heather. But sadly, there are still many pulpits in the Christian community, in the Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox world, where women are not accepted as full preachers and leaders of the church. But change is coming every day. Having just elected a woman and person of color as our vice president, and even more so knowing that our seminaries right now are preparing for ordination scores of gifted women, we work persistently for now there to be gender parity in our nation's pulpits. And we will always insist that it's a heresy to believe that half of God's children should be marginalized in the church any longer. And that's part of the reason why it's important for me to preach about Deborah. It's not something that should only be done by Heather or Patrice. It's not for women to challenge and correct the sins of patriarchy alone, just as it's not for African Americans to educate whites about racism, nor is it for Native Americans to teach us late arrivals the lessons about stolen homelands and broken promises. Or is it for immigrants to convince us that there's beauty to be found in different cultures? Or for gay, lesbian, and transgender individuals to constantly explain to others about the God-given richness and the diversity of expressions of human sexuality in the world? As we speak up from our places of privilege, we then are able to move from hierarchies of prejudice into then open communities of justice, compassion, and equality. So once again, my sermon today is about Deborah, a prophet, a judge, and a military leader of old. Now those are three titles we don't often hear associated with women in the Bible. In the Bible, we hear about women who served as wives and mothers, as helpers and caregivers, and all of those were incredibly important roles. But women should not be restricted to just a short list of socially accepted and understood roles and titles. The African-American preacher Howard Thurman once spoke about the dangerous time in American history when everyone assumed that segregation was normal. And so they believed that if racial bias like this was normal, well then it must be correct. And if it's correct, then it must be moral. And if it's moral, then it must be religious. And suddenly through a progression fatally flawed, religion was then made to be a defender and guarantor of racist sin. 
So in a similar way, if normal women's stories are only told in relation to their roles as wives, then what does that say about women who choose singleness or who live without a partner? If women's stories are only told in relation to motherhood, what does that say about those who, who do not, cannot, or who choose not to bear children? Exceptional women have accomplished great things simply because they refuse to be restricted to a very short list of male-approved roles. Think about Wilhelmina Fleming and Annie Jump Cannon, who were astronomers literally cataloging novas and stars in the late 1800s. Or think about Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Dorothy Vaughn, the African-American hidden figures who were crucial in calculating the space flights of NASA years ago. Think about powerful women like Eleanor Roosevelt, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the influence they've had on scores of young women. And think about how young girls today can actually ask living politicians like Amy Klobuchar, Nikki Haley, Hillary Clinton, Madeleine Albright, Nancy Pelosi, Michelle Obama, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and yes, Kamala Harris, and ask them, can I accomplish the same things that you have done? And hear back from these women the reply, yes, of course. All this and even more can be done by you. The news reporter Koki Roberts wrote a book called We Are Our Mother's Daughters, and in Koki's book she said this, We women have the scars to show that we knocked down barriers rather than jumped over them, thus making it easier for the women who followed us. Progress means shaking off the labels that others would put upon us. It happened when slave women Araminta Rose and Isabella van Ragneren refused to be called by the names of their slave masters and rechristened themselves Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. It means that women would have the persistence of the widow described in Luke chapter 18, the woman who knocked and knocked on the door of an ungrateful judge, persistently demanding that he hear her case until she wore him down and granted her justice. It means believing and knowing that in Christ Jesus, there are no hierarchies defined and based on prejudice. There are no talents that somehow are restricted to one gender or one race or one sexual identity. And knowing that nothing neither height nor depth nor rulers nor powers nor anything else in all creation can separate us from our common identity as beloved children of God in Jesus Christ. And so for one last time, my sermon today is about Deborah, a prophet, a judge, a military leader whose presence made all the difference in the world. Deborah was a leader in a time when leaders were scarce. People would go to her, men would defer to her, and she would wisely then offer judgment, both on civil cases and counsel as they sought to solve problems in their communities. Deborah was a person inspired by God, filled by God's spirit, and so she was known and recognized as a prophet. But Deborah also had authority, the authority to then call forth a military leader like Barak and have him then summon an army of 10,000 soldiers that would challenge and defeat the larger army under control of General Sisera. But see, what stands out clearest in this story is there in the end. It was Deborah's faithful presence that turned the tides of Israel's history. Look, there are some things in life that we simply do not want to go through alone. There are times when we need someone to be beside us, when we need someone to have our back, someone who will not leave or forsake us. Now, sometimes that special person 
is no longer living and beside us, but the memory of them, like a mother or a father, a grandmother or grandfather, a friend or a mentor or teacher, we imagine them right beside us, and that gives us the strength to carry on, finding confidence from their wisdom, courage, and love. But other times, we literally need someone to stand beside us. Barak had 10,000 men in his army, but he refused to go into battle unless one woman, Deborah the prophet, promised to be with him. He needed her wisdom. He needed her faithfulness and connection to God. He needed her presence. And that's precisely why Deborah is so important to each one of us today. Because whoever you are, And whatever life has set before you and whatever the world has laid on your shoulders, you can still be a Deborah for someone else. You can listen and counsel. You can guide and teach and encourage. You can pray and support. By being you, by being the gift of God that is your life, and by being you for someone else, you literally are the hands of Christ seeking to make a difference in this world. Remember, we are followers of Jesus Christ, the one called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus is that presence of God in our midst, and so we are never alone. And by his grace, great things are possible. So accept your calling to be a minister of presence. Now more than ever, there are people that are anxious and alone and afraid and struggling. There are children needing someone to look up to. There are elderly people longing to see someone who will stand beside them. So just as Deborah was present in a time of great need, may you be a Deborah for someone else. Be present beside them and encourage them to trust and believe and know that they are not alone. By God's grace, may it be so. Amen.